afternoon. Uh, my name is Kara Ritzheimer, and I'm an associate professor in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion. On behalf of the Citizenship and Crisis Initiative, the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion, and the OSU Center for the Humanities, I'd like to welcome you all to today's panel, discussion titled The Nationalist Backlash in Europe. Over the past few years, several European countries have experienced a rise in nationalism and far-right parties. While politics in Poland and Hungary may have been trending in this direction for a little longer, I think people really started to pay attention to nationalism and take it seriously in June 2016 when a majority of British voters said yes to Brexit, uh, Britain's departure from the European Union. At nearly the same time, Germany saw the growth of Alternative for Germany, a far-right nationalist political party that became the third largest party in the, in the Bundestag this past September. And for several years now, Russian President Vladimir Putin has been using nationalism to strengthen his position both at home and abroad. Why is nationalism on the rise? Is it here to stay? What will happen to the diplomatic and economic alliances that European countries, often and together with American encouragement and support, carefully knit together in the years following World War II? Our distinguished panelists today will shed light on these topics. Our plan is uh, to have each person speak for about 12 or 15 minutes, and then we'll have time at the end for questions and answers. So I'm going to introduce everyone now, if that's okay, and then we'll just uh, get going. Our first panelist is Philip Kneiss. Dr. Kneiss teaches in the political science program at OSU. He received his master's degree from Humboldt University <coughs> of Berlin in history and American studies, and his MA in American studies, did I get that right? From the University of Potsdam. PhD. PhD, sorry. So um, he regularly teaches transatlantic and European politics. His research centers on cultural and political theory, as well as humanistic gerontology. gerontology. His publications include Saged by Culture, Representations of Old Age in American Indian Literature and Culture, and The Emancipation of the Soul, Means of Destiny in American Mythological Television. Our second panelist, Dr. Keith Baker, is an assistant professor in the School of Public Policy. His main research interests are public administration and British politics. He has published on a range of topics, including electricity market reform in Britain, Governance in Nuclear Industry and Governance in Post-Evasion Iraq. His book titles include Nuclear Power and Energy Policy, The Limits to Governance, published by Paul Gray, and A Critical Review of Scottish Renewable and Low Carbon Energy Policy, also published by Paul Gray. Um, Dr. Baker moved to Oregon in 2014 from the UK and has found the reign is quite similar. <laughs> Our third panelist is Dr. Alison Johnston. Dr. Johnston is an associate professor in political science and public policy. Her areas of expertise are the European Union and European integration, political economy, and European comparative politics. She has recently published a book on the Euro crisis titled From Convergence to Crisis, Labor Markets and the Instability of the Euro with Cornell University Press and is working on two projects at the present moment which cover the political economy of housing in Europe and sovereign credit risk before and after the Euro crisis. Our last panelist is Dr. Sarah Henderson. Dr. Henderson is an associate professor of political science. Her research focuses on, on democratization and authoritarianism in the former Soviet Union. Her publications include Building Democracy in Contemporary Russia with Cornell Press and Women and Politics in a Global World, published with Oxford. And her current projects examine Russian membership in the Council of Europe and civil society in the Putin era. And so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Smith in case we need to panic later. So I'm trying, I mean, we came, came up with the idea of doing this panel because last year everybody kind of started to be more and more in a panic mode. And I'm not here to say everything is okay, but also I'm not saying that everything is, uh, is cause for alarm, but just to kind of inform a little bit about what I think is going on. Um, I'll briefly just introduce you to the German policy system since 1990. Then say what nationalist movements we currently have, talk about the AfD party, and then we look a little bit back in history because that's what I do. And um, then we think of, uh, look at what, what really may be going on. So the German party system since 1990, so since unification, and I'm using this left-right model because everybody uses it even though it's imperfect. So um, from left to right to the right, you have the links party and the left party, which is a result of the fusion of the former Communist Party with some offspring from the Social Democrats who are center-left. Then you have the Greens who are somehow in the center, sometimes more left. 
the Free Democrats, you could, you could say the Libertarians, um, center-right, and the CDU, CSU, the Christian Democratic Union, Christian Social Union. Uh, CSU only exists in Bavaria, CDU does exist area, but Bavaria. And so they're center-right or whatever. Part of the problem is nobody really knows what, whether these labels all hold true again, anymore. We also have on the right um, um, some political parties uh, that are to the right of the CDU, CSU, and some movements. Um, as parties go, um, there's a nas uh, National Democratic Party in Germany, which I cannot say anything but that they are National Socialists or Nazi Party. Uh, there are also the Secret Service uh, monitoring them, and so, and so, so they're they're being observed and. Um, they merged recently with the DFAU, the German People's Union, which is also a right-wing party. Another right-wing party that um, has gotten a little, little less attention recently are the Republicans. They call themselves Völkisch, so which is a version of nationalists. You could say they have some Nazi things. Then there was another party that was prominent um, after the um, GDR became um, had the free elections, the Deutsche Sozial Union, the German Social Union. I would say they're really very conservative, very Christian, but not necessarily um, <coughs> extremist. And then you have the AfD since 2012. On the other side of that line, you find a few movements uh, that have cropped up recently. One is the Pegida movement, uh, Patriotische Europäer gegen die Islamisierung des Abendlandes. Yeah, um, not the West. Oftentimes you see this. Um, translated wrongly. They, uh, the term that's used is Abendland or Occident. By, and so this motivates some historical associations. Now then we have a, a movement called the Reichsbürgerbewegung, the sovereign citizen movement, people who claim that West Germany or current Germany does not exist as a state, but just as a business, and is not sovereign in the United States, and uh, some other states are really in control. Then the identitarian movement, which really started in France uh, and takes its logo from the movie 300, uh, because the Spartans wear these shields. And um, then you sometimes see this Verma flag, which is originally a flag that was anti-Nazi, but that's modeled a little bit like on the Scandinavian flags. Yeah, so. You see this flag up there a little bit. And so it's used as an alternative flag to say, we are not identifying with the current state. Um, that flag actually is interesting because it represents originally an anti-Nazi flag, but it's now oftentimes used by people that are oftentimes associated with the far right. Whether or not correctly so, we shall maybe see. The sovereign citizen movement uh, you see here um, some propaganda associated with that, allied dictation. We, are the, we the people are the only sovereign. Then you had a very curious event. The coronation of um, Peter Fitzek for the Kingdom of Germany was a very hokey <laughs> affair. He uh, owned a city block um, in Wittenberg, and uh, they busted him once he established a national bank because that was a little bit too far. <laughs> um, the Reichsburger typically have fake ID cards which say Deutsches Reich. Um, they pester um, city employees all over, so they p petition them to death to, to grind the bureaucracy to a halt. They also oftentimes put up fake water posts, posts and they have weapons oftentimes, and there have been cases where uh, people have um, attack police or have um, killed police that wanted to take um, um, to arrest them and so they they're rather scary as a movement right now um, Pegida as I mentioned before is um, uh, are these uh, people call themselves patriots against the Islamization of the Occident you see that this graphic there, which is taken from these um, signs at the California-Mexico border, careful immigrants running across the street, is being turned into this, rape, refugees, um, not welcome, they say, and they say, close the borders, on this other one they say, Putin, help us, defend us against the corrupt 
anti-people West German regime and uh, had protectors from America and Israel. Then you see the head <coughs> of Pegida, which is uh, Lutz Bachmann, also posing as a joke, he says, uh, as Hitler, and then um, um, Chancellor Merkel um, with a burqa as a, um, as a photoshopped version. So this, there's some anger there. Um, we shouldn't be too complacent in, in looking at this because these uh, anti-globalists are rather global. So we remember um, uh, Amon Bundy and Finicum in the Mauria County, uh, county um, affair. Some Tea Party rhetoric uh, mimics the sovereign citizen movement. And Pegida has also spread to London and other cities. You know, so where people say Trump is right and they want to support anti-immigrant movements. Yeah. Another trend that you always say, of course, is the attack on the press, is Lügenpresse, the lying press, which is something that, yes, Nazis used it, but also people use this against the Nazis. Everybody who's ever had a political component has said the press is distorting the truth. And so this is an old game on both the left and the right. Uh, the word Lügenpresse Lügen was first used as such in, in the American context before it then was translated into fake news. Um, and it mimics a little bit Sarah Palin's mainstream media attacks. Here, um, we defeated fascism, now we imported, which uh, plays on the notion that um, um, all Muslims are distorted as being Islamo-fascist or as um, Islamicist. And um, then you also have this idea about uh, left-wing voters are being imported um, by having their refugees come. You have the same theme here on the radical right, that uh, the Democrats want to import left-wing voters from Mexico and so on. The key moment that everybody refers to is the New Year's Eve night, 2015, where indeed approximately 1,000 immigrants were and molested in, in Cologne at night by mostly immigrants, so, so that did happen. Um, police since then is on it, and it's not that they, every refugee is doing this. But in the public, uh, public consciousness, this has become a very public, popular theme. And so the um, photograph on the right, cousin, cousin them um, to um, Victor Orban, thank you. And they list his achievement, uh, this year, ach achievement of his in 2015 to close the fence as on the same level as the Hungarian uprising and the democratic revolution. You also have the curious phenomenon of the cross front, the queer front, where you have uh, left-wing extremists becoming right-wing extremists. So you have Jürgen Elsasser, who used to be a hardline communist now, writing for a hard-right-wing hard magazine. And on the right-hand side, you have uh, Dieter Dehm, the second to the left, uh, from the Links Partei, then Lars Mehrhaus, a peace activist, and then Ken Jebsen, a radio personality. Gibson is known for saying things like, I know who invented the Holocaust with PR, and says that 9 11 was a warm demolition and an inside job. So every conspiracy theory is converging. What does this have to do with the RFD? The RFD emerged actually as an anti Euro bailout party in 2012 um, by economics professor Bernd Lucke and nationalist uh, journalist Alexander Gauland. They reacted to the euro currency, cur uh, and they said this unites Europe rather than to bring it together. However, these kinds of pictures of refugees coming into Germany in 2015, of refugees heading from Africa to, to Italy, um, switched public opinion and changed the focus of the RFD a little bit into that direction. Many people are very angry at these kinds of selfies that Angela Merkel had done with um, refugees because they said this is attracting them to Germany. Um, their key positions tend to be, uh, they claim that there's a loss of national identity. They call for the return of the nation state vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Reject Islam, gender studies, focus on traditional family values and have a nominal support for Christian values and um, they support each other all throughout Europe and America. So you see Nigel Farage up there uh, of Brexit fame together with um, Beatrix von Storch, who was famous for suggesting maybe should, we can start shooting refugees at the border. So Bernd Lucke left the party, or was left. 
he, he is not no longer part of it. Paul Petri, who also is a far right person, uh, sometimes you never know, um, left the party actually after securing a seat in the parliament. And the two main leaders are really uh, Alexander Gauland <coughs> and Alice Weidel. And despite their support for traditional well, um, family values, Alice Weidel is also openly lesbian, and so she doesn't quite fit that scheme of what the rest of the party is saying. And then you have um, several people that fall into the more extremist mold. They have softcore Holocaust denial. And Björn Höcke is famous for saying Germans are the only people in the world who plant a monument of shame in the heart of their capital and saying this laughable policy of coming to terms with the past is crippling us. Whereas André Pockenburg had that to say about Turkish Germans, and I'm sorry, this is, these are not my words. These caraway seed traders have their own genocide of 1.5 million Armenians on their hours. Oh, sorry, this is a German. These camel drivers should go back to where they belong, far, far, far beyond the Bosporus to their mud huts and mud little wives. He has been called out by the party a little bit and had to walk it back a little bit, but not too much. Since 2014, the party has gained seats in uh, local parliaments. And there's also another pattern. If you look at um, election results for the NPD in 2013 and the RFD in 2017, mind that there is a severe difference in percentage points. The maximum the NPD ever gets is 5%. The RFD maximum was 35%. 0.5. And you see it clusters a little bit in the east, at the borders mainly. But you also have it in the west. It's not necessarily an East German phenomenon only. And these are all West German politicians, even though some of them live in the East and can, are candidates in the East. So it's made to be an East German phenomenon. There are some reasons for that. So at the election, you have that picture with blue being the AfD, the rest the establishment parties. Should be panic. Well, if you look at who supports democracy, I would say that there are some in the AfD that are original CDU that would actually be could be seen as supporting democracy. And um, I even would concede the point that some in the Links party, more, more, more now than in the past, support democracy. We really have a clear support for democratic values in the parliament right now. What we have, though, is the return of a spectrum that we've had in Germany since 1871, that you have conservatives, liberal, uh, libertar uh, libertarians, then moderates, conservatives, and social democrats. Weimar started out with a really wide mix of parties, but 90% supporting democratic values. The critical thing in the Weimar Republic time was that by the end, only 43% of uh, political uh, representatives supported democratic values due to the rise of both the Nazi party and the Communist Party. But even in East Germany, even though that there were no elections that mattered, um, on the right, you see the official East German party landscape. Even there, you have a nationalist party included. And the first three elections in East Germany have the DSU as a conservative party in there. So what we are seeing, you could say, is kind of the return to, to a normalcy in which there is a permanent, maybe right-wing presence in parliament. Why did this happen? It happened because parties shifted. Uh, the FDP dabbled a little bit in anti-Semitism in 2002 and moved to the right. The SPD did some welfare reforms, moved to the right, created this offspring that moved with the left, um, with the communists to the left party. The Greens keep moving left, and the CDU, CSU, you could probably say was sick and tired of always being seen as the right wingers, and they moved to the left too, especially when Angela Merkel said, you know. We have to support gay rights, we have to support Euro bailouts, and with all these refugees in the Balkans, somebody had to take them in, and the position was we are the biggest country, if anybody can do this, then we should. But you bet the next call was to Viktor Orban is defense ready yet. Yeah, so people focus on letting people in, they don't see that maybe the other thing happened too. The AfD is trying to play two positions. They try to make themselves into the real party of the center by saying we take, o take over the center that is vacated by the FDP, by the Greens, but they also play to the right-wing extremes. 
where they will go, we don't know yet. So as I was saying, you have probably a return of a distinctly national spectrum here. The RFD is not the same as Pegida, but it signals to the right, and so they try to get votes from there. It's unsure how to position itself. If it moves to the right and moves to the extreme, it may face the same fate as all the nationalist parties in Germany, that they will sink, um, sink down in voter popularity because of heavy infighting too. While Putin has some kinds of interests in Europe, and we'll hear later from uh, Sarah Henderson about that, this aligns only partly with Pegida. Some of the Russian friendliness is there because um, actually Russian German immigrants to Germany are against immigrants in many cases. And the AfD has managed to capture their voter potential. It's like, I was able to get in, but no one else should come in after me. Um, you have fears of antagonizing Russia. War against Russia has never played out well in Europe. And there's also German exceptionalism because Germany tradition has not seen itself as part of the West. They see, see itself as part of the center. What does not help probably is demonizing and ignoring of the AfD. We've seen it in Austria with the FPÖ. There the right-wing party was demonized, excluded all the time, and they just kept growing in power. Now we'll see what um, courts will be able to do with them. So what should be done, maybe? So some of these are persistent criticism that maybe we need to listen to, because one of the mistakes is People are saying things, and if we don't listen, then maybe things will get worse. There is a blending of news and commentary <coughs> that people keep complaining about. People say there's nothing neutral anymore in information. Especially in East Germany, you have people who are very much interested not to have to go back to a dictatorship. It may look like they're radicalized, but oftentimes it's a form of anger that is aimed at what they perceive as a system. Some Incomers are refugees, but some are also immigrants. Yeah, so there are limits to how many people can be taken in. Uh, the EU rules actually say as soon as you're in a safe country, you need to stay there. Why does everybody want to come to Germany? As soon as they're in Turkey, when they left Syria, they're actually safe. Why, why keep going? Immigration does need some level of control, probably, because there's a need for living space and resources. There's a severe housing, housing shortage right now. Uh, jobs uh, getting scarce. These are concerns that people keep bringing up. Increases in crime have happened sometime, although the numbers have been going down recently, but people don't trust statistics. You have rising anti-Semitism, both on the right but also on the left. You, know, you have the boycott and the sanctions uh, movement, you have um, Corbyn in Britain, you have this cross-front phenomenon. And um, Henrik Boda, he's a frequent commentator on German politics, he, said, he says frequently that historical responsibility cannot be whitewashed by taking in immigrants. So if Germany thinks that by taking in all these immigrants we're getting rid of German guilt, that's the wrong way to do it. However, there need also be clear borders. Germany needs immigrants due to its law of birth rate. To say we don't need immigration is simply wrong. Germany has always been multi-ethnic. Yeah, the ethnically cleansed Nazi vision of Germany is wrong. Statistics show, show that crime levels are going down, and you cannot possibly suggest that refugees from war zones need to be sent back. And the radicalized political language is not suitable for democracy. So I would say overall, the picture is mixed. And so all I can do is go back to Bertrand Brecht, who in his um, piece, Der Aufhaltsame Aufstieg des Autor Ui, which is a parody of Hitler's rise, ends with, the womb is fertile still from whence that called. With that optimistic statement, <laughs> I'll transition to you. Well, I'm Keith, uh, Dr. Baker, Dr. Keith Baker, and I titled this Not At All Surprising. Now, many of you will be able to tell by the accent, I'm not the but um, I am British, except there's a degree of subtlety in that. I'm actually English, and that when you hear what I've got to say, you'll understand why I say that England is the issue here. 
It isn't Britain voted for Brexit. England voted for Brexit. And that's quite important. But when we start talking about Brexit, in actual fact, I don't think it's very surprising that England voted for Brexit. Now we'll start with a bit of background that some of these figures I produced, some of them I cut and pasted from people who are infinitely smarter than me, but it um, illustrates the point. Now, these are just some of the demographics of Brexit, but also the geography of Brexit. As you can see, England. More specifically though, England <coughs> in the rural areas, the big urban conurbations, and the London commuter belt, which as you will see, the sheer size of London in a few minutes is kind of important as well. Also, but pretty much everywhere else voted for Remain. They voted to stay in the EU. Now, of course, the wonders of PowerPoint um, producing a slightly misleading scales. As you can see, it starts at 46 and only to 52. So despite the graph looking a lot bigger, the difference between men and women was not that great. It was pretty evenly split, Britain pretty much evenly split overall. And the reason for that, of course, is England. Now, one of the things I've had to do with this is education in Britain is not directly comparable to education in the US. What you have is you also have some crossover because the way Britain classifies some college versus degree or higher, it's not directly comparable. So it's judging rough numbers here. Post-16 is A-level, high school or lower is no qualifications. De degree or higher, there is some rounding as well. So the numbers, numbers are close. <coughs> now this is where there's more interest, the more interesting stuff. Education, it's pretty split. GBA, and I've suddenly realised there's a typo, I'll ignore the dollar sign. <laughs> Britain uses pounds, not dollars. GBA is just a measure of gross value added. It's a way of understanding overall contribution to the economy. Now, as you can see, look at the size of London. 8.7 million people in the London area. London itself is as big, if not bigger, than most of the rest of the UK. It's huge. England is 53 million people. It's 84 percent of the British population. So when I say that there's an English problem, there really is an English problem. England is the overwhelming weight of the economy. It's the overwhelming weight of the public overall. And it's concentrated in London. A huge part of the British economy and population is based in London. What this means is that in any referenda, England was going to be able to overpower the other parts of the UK if the vote was close. Now, my personal opinion is that David Cameron is an idiot. <laughs> and that's my professional opinion as well. <laughs> but, um, essentially, what should have happened is if you've got a country like this, where the overwhelming weight of the public is in one part, you simply say it needs a majority in all parts of the UK to prevent the English deciding <coughs> for everyone else. Because the one thing that the English like to do historically is decide for other people. We're very good at that. We've tried to decide for, for you once as well. <laughs> it didn't go well. But this is also interesting as well. Average salaries. Again, if you compare qualifications 
to average salary. You start to find that the UK average is not that high and is distorted, of course, by high level degree earners. And you also find that people with, of course, no qualifications or very low level qualifications actually earn a lot less than everybody else. It's not really surprising. And this is because Britain is not really a manufacturing economy. It's what's called a service sector economy. The economy is driven by service sector jobs. And service sector jobs are often relatively high skill jobs. They require what we call, or the National Office of Statistics calls, high level cognitive skills, which require the higher levels of education. Now, that's kind of important. Just remember, low levels of income leads to lower qualifications. Now, I didn't do this analysis. This is by a guy called Torsten Bell, and I decided rather than reinvent the wheel, he did it much better than I did, so I decided to use his. What he did was he tracked the UK regions at GBP per head, which is a good measure of the overall strength of the regional economies, and by Brexit vote. And of course, the poorer regions of the UK, the North, tended to vote for Brexit. Of course, London, the wealthier regions didn't. Oddly enough, Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to remain in the UK. Sorry, remain in the EU. Scotland did vote to remain in the UK as well. <laughs> there is uh, an explanation for that seeming discrepancy. The first thing is, is that the guarantor of the Northern Ireland Peace Agreement, because there was a civil war there a while back, is the European Union the absence of border controls, European grants. Also as well, I would go as far as to possibly suggest that Scotland, the Scotland, the European Union, is a hedge against its southern neighbour. The European Union enables Scotland to avoid being completely economically overpowered by its southern neighbour. It also enables relatively frictionless trade between England and Scotland, easy for access to financial, and because there's a lot of financial industries in Scotland. The British Student Loan Company is based in Glasgow, in Scotland. Many British banks have their headquarters in Scotland, partly because they can take advantage of lower cost of living rather than London. Scotland, the EU, is a hedge, despite Scotland being comparatively poor within the UK, but the north of England. And when you look at the, the R squareds, to explain the variation, what you find is you take London and Scotland out and look only at the English regions, you find the association is really, really strong. Income is an incredibly good predictor of whether or not place votes for Brexit. Okay? That's not a particularly great insight. Economics matters. Well, that's got everything to do with nationalism because of immigration. Now, overall, immigration levels in the UK aren't that great. In actual fact, roughly the same number of people are leaving Britain, including myself, as are coming into Britain. It's more or less the same. Well, actually, immigration matters in Britain because it's where immigrants go. It's not the overall numbers of immigrants because it roughly balances itself out. It's who the immigrants are competing with. Now these are the percentages of the population. Again, you have to lump some college and degree and higher together 
because Britain doesn't separate those two out easily in statistics. This bit, about nearly a, over a third of the population. And what I did here was I decided to calculate, based on work by Mori, Polar, polling agency, roughly what percentage of the British public are support, the English public, are supporting particular parties. And we have here the wonderful British National Party. Now, thankfully, this group of clowns have kind of disappeared. That they've been exposed as career criminals and a bunch of rather unpleasant individuals, and they've largely become a, an electoral irrelevance. However, in 2006, they were not. And I think the BNP are actually pretty telling because of this professed voting intentions. Now these are percentages of the overall expression. So what you see is you can see people saying, oh, I would vote for BNP and I would consider voting for UKIP, which is why you get these numbers. And what you see is you see large numbers of people in the working class would consider supporting UKIP, Nigel Farage, the UK Independence Party, whereas very few people in the middle in the middle or upper classes consider supporting the BNP, but just over half of people would say they would consider supporting the BNP in the working class. You go down to Britain's underclass, you see these kind of numbers. What I think this is telling, telling us is that the lower the socioeconomic group, the more likely people are to profess support for, host for parties hostile to immigration. The British National Party and UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party. What, these, what this is showing is that the white English don't like immigrants if they're poor. And of course, that's got everything to do with who immigrants are competing with. Britain makes it very, very difficult to acquire jobs that have high skills, There is uh, require high skills. There are huge numbers of certifications required, the level of what's called certification. We actually refer to it as the audit society, where everything has to be verified you need certificates, you need licenses. Now you get those from degrees, you get those from college. If you fled Syria, for example, your degree certificate is in Syria. And it doesn't matter anyway because British universities and British employers won't recognize a degree from a Syrian university. You could be a doctor from Syria and you can't practice medicine because the British government will not recognise your medical degree. So you have no qualifications as far as Britain is concerned. So what happens is where do you go? Well, you get a job as a cleaner. You get a job serving lunches. You get jobs in the minimum wage economy, in the low skill economy, whereupon you are competing with low skilled people in Britain and, of course, they regard you as competition. That's why they're giving those kind of numbers, because they're explicitly linking immigration with an economic threat. And I thought I'd end on this, because this was about the most evil-looking cat I could find. <laughs> and I would end by asking the English to vote on European Union membership was like trying to buy the cat. It's not going to end well, and it's going to end in blood and tears, to paraphrase Enoch Powell. That this is why England voted to, out of the EU, because a large section of the English population saw immigration as a threat. There were a significant number of people in the higher economic groups who, for whatever reason, romantic nationalism, mistaken beliefs in the financial burden of the EU, objected to the European Union as well. 
together, that's enough to push Britain out just. But I would blame the English. And uh, as an Englishman, that's rather depressing to say my compatriots are responsible. But this time we genuinely are that it was the English that pushed Britain out of the European Union. And we did it as a combination of immigration threat and romantic ideas of the status of Britain. But I personally think it was largely down to the fear of immigration in Britain's working class and underclass communities who saw immigrants as a direct threat to them. The European Union allows freedom of movement. Movement of large numbers of people is possible within the EU. And for Britain, and particularly for working class and low socioeconomic groups in Britain, that was terrifying. Because there was something for them in the claim that immigrants would take their jobs. And that's what I think was going on. That's why I was blaming a cat, because this could have been predicted. The figures I'm using are from 2006. These were widely known. This was known to David Cameron. This was known to the Conservative Party. This isn't him. Which is why I say he was an idiot. <laughs> and I'm going to end on that. Okay, thank you very much. So the Germans and the Brits, well, English, not the Brits, have gone off the deep end. So what does the EU do about this hot mess going on, not just in the UK, but also in Germany? Well, I'm going to provide kind of a short discussion uh, about uh, problems with nationalism and populism that the EU is experiencing that aren't just happening uh, within the United Kingdom and within Germany. And again, as, as Carol mentioned in her, her discussion, you know, we should all probably see 2016 as the real wake-up year, right? This is when Brexit happened. Uh, it took a lot of European elites by surprise, particularly given the fact that polls did not predict uh, that this was an outcome that was going to happen. Uh, and then equally, I think, equally traumatic for the EU was the election of Trump in November 2016, because Donald Trump, he was uh, very supportive of Brexit. He was very supportive of Nigel Farage. Uh, on numerous occasions, he has supported uh, various anti-EU uh, and Eurosceptic groups within the EU, and so this is something that made EU leaders uh, far more uh, cautious and pessimistic. Angela Merkel, in fact, uh, uh, amongst some other European countries, wants to basically pursue even more independence uh, uh, from, from the United States in terms of how foreign policy and economic policy are cooperated. Uh, but I would say 2017 actually was a little bit of a, a, a year of relief for the European Union, because I think you had a little bit of a backlash to the populist backlash. Continental Europe saw what happened in the UK, it saw what happened in the US, and it said, hmm, maybe not. Let's, let's not jump over this abyss. And so there were a couple of events in 2017 that I think brought a, a bit of relief to the EU, but then I'm going to argue that recent events in 2018 uh, have caused it to become more concerned and more troubled with, with nationalism within its borders. So starting first with the Dutch elections. Uh, so the Dutch elections happened in early 2017. This was really kind of the first major European election that happened after Brexit and Trump. Uh, and polls going into the election had uh, Gert Wilder, uh, who's far right, uh, um, Party for Freedom, which is uh, PVV. They had him listed as the front runner, that his party was going to get the most seats, uh, which was very concerning for the EU because, again, he's very anti EU, he's anti the euro. Uh, and then the elections happened, and it turned out that the current leader in charge, Mark Ritter, and his People's Party for Freedom, which is a center right, economically liberal party, uh, actually got the majority of the votes. And uh, Gert Wilder's uh, Party for Freedom uh, only got about 13%. So uh, in the end, uh, there was quite a significant resurgence amongst non-far-right party voters. 
Uh, and the EU was quite relieved by this uh, because there was a lot of concern that the uh, PVV was going to be the largest party in the Netherlands, and yet again you would have another EU country uh, that had a, a populist or anti-EU <coughs> leader leading its helm. So bullet dodged in the Netherlands. Then you have France. So this was the 2017 uh, French presidential election. So the way that the presidential election in France works is it happens according to two ballots. The first ballot, you have a multitude of candidates run, and then the top two are sent to the second round. So it's basically a two-candidate system. Uh, and the two uh, individuals that went to the second round were Emmanuel Macron, uh, whose party is a very new party, and Marche, which is a very cosmopolitan party, a very pro-EU party, and then Marine Le Pen of the National Front, who is a very anti-EU party, very close with UKIP uh, and, and uh, very Euroskeptic forces outside of France. And as you can see, he won in a landslide. He won 66% of the second round vote, so disaster to avert it. But 2018 has proven a bit of a backtrack against this backlash, against the populist backlash. And I would actually say that 2018 is showing developments that are actually a little bit more problematic than Brexit. From, from my personal and professional opinion, uh, as an EU scholar, I actually kind of think Brexit's a good thing. And I think it's a good thing for a number of reasons. One is the, the UK is very skeptical with European integration. They're, they're, they drag their heels all the time. They're laggers. They always kind of put up obstacles. So having them out of the way is going to make EU integration much easier. And in fact, there have been discussions as to what this is particularly going to mean for European defense coordination. Uh, but secondly, um, Brexit is going really horribly right now. The British government has no idea what it's doing. It doesn't really have any idea of how the EU works and how you access the single market and how in order to access the single market, you have to allow EU immigration within the European Union's borders. And they don't seem to really kind of understand how this whole package works. Uh, and so consequently, uh, a lot of people are worried that you're going to have this hard Brexit where basically Britain wakes up in 2019 and they realize they're down to WTO status. And oh no, we now have to inspect every single product that comes into the UK. <coughs> there's going to be food shortages. There's going to be massive lines uh, at, at kind of points of entry, etc. There's already been uh, a number of businesses relocating their offices out of the UK and onto the continent so they can access the single market. Uh, and the British elite, as Keith could tell you in his spare time, over multiple drinks, uh, really doesn't know what it's doing, right? It, it, it's going very horribly. And incidentally enough, you've actually seen, particularly after the Brexit vote, a big kind of rise in support for the EU. Even in countries like Denmark, which tends to be quite Euroskeptic, Support for the EU after uh, Brexit, after the immediate result of Brexit, uh, went up and it's remained pretty resilient. Uh, and even really kind of problematic, more illiberal democracies in the EU's eastern um, uh, rim, notably Hungary and Poland, are actually also quite supportive of the EU and uh, securing a deal with Britain that would protect the EU because they benefit a lot from what's known as the free movement of people. So the European Union is based upon this kind of notion of four freedoms, free movement of goods, free movement of services, free movement of capital, free movement of labor. Free movement of labor basically means if you live in an EU member state, you can go and you can work somewhere else within the European Union. There's no kind of bars to you doing so if you are a part of the Schengen area. So Brexit, I think, actually is going to be a silver lining uh, for the EU. But I think uh, two recent elections that, ha that have happened in Europe are now demonstrating um, that a kind of populist backlash is back and it could potentially be a problem for the EU. Now, just really quickly, also with 2017, I think Philip was absolutely right. You know, this is a problem, but probably we shouldn't freak out. All for Deutschland did get about 13%. Um, for 13% uh, uh, of seats within the German parliament, but unlike the Weimar Republic years, uh, none of these parties here have expressed a willingness or desire to work with this kind of far-right party. So again, kind of in line with 2017, a bit of a relief. But there's two events in particular in 2018 that I think are quite problematic for the EU, uh, and that are going to move beyond Brexit, and that I think are more problematic than Brexit. One is the 2018 Italian election. So this happened in March 4th. 
Um, and basically, in, in, in this particular graphic here, the center right is really composed of a multitude of parties. Uh, so this kind of, the, the way that the electoral system in, in Italy works is that generally um, when, when people go to the polls, there's a number of parties within each of these factions, with the exception of the Five Star Movement, which is a uh, anti-establishment party, but a left-wing kind of cosmopolitan anti-establishment party. This is its own party, but within the center right you have a collection of parties that includes the Northern League, who is Matteo uh, Salvini, currently kind of governs that center-right coalition. Everyone's favorite Italian politician, Silvio Berlusconi, uh, and his Forza Italia is also in this coalition. Uh, but the center-right coalition uh, has won the majority of votes and the majority of seats within the recent Italian elections. And the Five Star Movement received the second highest number of seats within the Italian elections. Uh, Matteo Renzi, who used to be the Prime Minister of Italy, quite pro-EU, <coughs> his center-left coalition was particularly routed uh, in the Italian elections in March. So why is this problematic? Well, the center-right coalition uh, is led by an individual, Matteo uh, Sal Salvini, <coughs> who is the head of Northern League, who called the euro currency a crime against humanity. He's very much against the EU, he's made no secret about it. Uh, people within his coalition also very much against the EU. Uh, and the one kind of political faction that could uh, adequately challenge him, the Five Star Movement, is also anti-EU. In fact, they want to have a referendum on leaving the euro currency, uh, although they have walked back from that. So Italy right now actually has a very strong Eurosceptic anti-EU majority within its parliament. Um, and even though this election happened uh, in, 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 on, on March 4th, uh, the, the, the government is, is still in, in the process of forming. You have a hung parliament uh, problem where no party has enough for the majority. So they're kind of figuring out which parties are going to be involved in the final coalition. Uh, so one kind of big concern, at least coming from Italy, is that, oh no, we've got all of these anti-EU parties. Uh, dominating the Italian uh, parliamentary scene. Now, the one kind of reason why I don't think this is incredibly problematic for the European Union is because Italian politics is very disorganized. So again, they've been working on forming a government for about two months now. If they don't form one by August, elections are going to be reheld, and there's a lot of discontent and disagreement as to what kind of a government is gonna be formed in terms of which collection of parties is gonna assemble uh, and run Italy. So I think the good news for the EU is, quite frankly, Italian politics doesn't have its act together, right? It's very disorganized, it's very chaotic, and there's not really kind of a clear strongman in either the center right or the five star movement that would want to kind of organize against Europe that could come to the fore and do significant damage to the EU and threaten the Italy's position within it, because the Italians, they just don't have their act together. They're very chaotic. Good news in being chaotic. Rather, I think the real problem for the EU uh, is what's going on right now in Poland and in Hungary. So Poland and Hungary have had uh, quite a flirtatious affair with a liberal democracy. Uh, Poland's Law and Justice Party has politicized the civil service. They've turned public media into a propaganda tool. And they've recently proposed legislation to remove judicial independence, which is a central foundation of being an EU member. Viktor Orban and his Fidesz party in Hungary uh, also has engaged in similar activity. Uh, he has modified the Hungarian constitution to make it easier for his party to get super majorities. And we saw this very clearly uh, in the last week. Uh, Hungary had an election and Viktor Orban's party won a two-thirds majority in parliament with only 49% of the popular vote. So he also uh, is threatening um, uh, the, the independence of the judiciary in Hungary, uh, and the EU has really gotten a lot of flack that they have not done anything uh, to prevent this slide into uh, a liberal democracy within Poland and Hungary. Now, the only way that the EU could actually do something against these two countries is by instigating something called Article 7. So Article 7 basically states uh, the EU can remove voting rights as well as EU funding 
from members that violate fundamental foundations of the EU treaties, including respect for human rights and uh, uh, political rights and respect for political democracy. The bad news, however, is in order to impose Article 7 on another, another member state, you need unanimity. And as you can imagine, Hungary has come <coughs> to Poland's defense, and they say, we're illiberal buddies in crime, we're not going to vote for this. So Article 7 is off the table. But in line with Philip's slightly optimistic assessment, I would say that the EU is finding that it does have a couple of policy um, uh, tools at its disposal for which it can kind of combat this rise in populism. And one, the most important tools is the EU's structural funds. So these funds basically go to poor countries and poor areas. 4% of Poland's public expenditure comes from the EU. 7% of Hungary's come from the EU. And these matter a lot, and these politicians know that they matter a lot. So while they're willing to kind of beat their chests and wave their fists at the European Union, uh, they are not gonna push that nuclear button and do anything that will potentially threaten these funds. And the EU currently is actually negotiating its 2021 to 2027 budget cycle. So there is a potential threat there that the EU could enforce some financial penalties or, or make this kind of rise in a liberalism hurt. And consequently, I do think you have seen uh, both the Law and Justice Party in Poland as well as even Viktor Orban kind of stepping away from some of their most brutal illiberal tendencies, particularly in regards to uh, making the judicial branch dependent on the whims of the government. So to conclude uh, my 15 minutes, I guess I would say three things about how the EU is handling the current rise in populism. It's bad, but it's not crazy bad. It's not a crisis. <laughs> One, Brexit is demonstrating that there is a worst case scenario with leaving the European Union. And for the most part, other countries, though they threaten that they're going to do so, are not following suit. Two, even the threats of leaving that you do see are not entirely credible. And you see this particularly within Italy, even though leading coalitions say they do not want the EU, it is not entirely clear how they will mobilize and launch an effective front in order to actually pull the trigger and initiate Article 50 to leave the EU. And then third, one possible silver lining that the EU also has is that it's realizing that by have integrating these countries so thoroughly together, by providing financial assistance, particularly to poorer countries, it actually does have quite a few tools at its disposal uh, in terms of bringing many autocrats potentially So I'm here to talk about Russia and trying to get at what, what is Russia trying to do in Europe, what are its aspirations, um, and how can we measure its impact. And I think anyone who's picked up a paper, right, or looked at, surfed the internet, um, cannot escape the rhetoric about um, Russia and Russian intervention in elections. And I think if you read the media, um, Vladimir Putin is one of the media's, I would say, favorite supervillains. Um, one portrayal is sort of the, what I would call the dark Putin version of what's happening in Europe. The dark Putin character is that um, there are nefarious Kremlin intrigues that involve poison double agents sowing chaos in European elections with a master plan to overthrow the entire European and world democratic order. Tough sanctions are the only way to deal with a leader bent on global domination. I think there's a second narrative about Putin that I would call the Putler narrative. Um, this one discusses and focuses on Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014 and intervention in the Donbass, um, its military actions in Syria, and quickly telescope to future visions that um, Russia is simply trying to restore the old borders of the USSR. It's a scary, revanchist, aggressive, and expansionist reincarnation. In this view, any kind of negotiation with Russia is tacit approval, appeasement is of the vilest kind, and the only thing that can hold Russia in check is beefing up NATO. Combine these two together, Darth Putin and Putler, and the pictures of a supervillain, both omnipresent, omniscient, and threatening. We are engaged in a life and death Cold War 2.0, and in the words of Speaker Paul Ryan, Russia is a global menace led by a man who is menacing. Get out your lightsabers. <laughs> On the other side, there's Another perspective, um, this one, that sees Russia as kind of the dying bear. Those kind of narratives focus on the fact 
that Russia is facing a, a host of problems that it can't really solve quickly. Um, it has a declining birth rate. Um, poverty levels are on the rise. Uh, some of the biggest killers are high rates of alcoholism, um, as well as one of the highest murder rates. Um, the, these kind of projections focus on the fact that the Russian economy is not growing and it's fairly dependent on energy exports. And that view was represented by former President Barack Obama, who expressed his view, noting that Russia was at best a regional power, a weaker country that doesn't produce anything worth buying except oil, gas, and arms. The policy implications of that was kind of marginalization, right? Why worry about Russia? It doesn't matter. It's going to implode and kill itself. Um, and finally, our current president seems to have a little bit of a schizophrenic view of Vladimir Putin, both some days portraying him almost in a James Bond kind of perspective, right? He's just a tough guy dealing in a tough world. Um, and that goes back and forth with perhaps being the super arch um, villain in, in James Bond. Um, that um, the best way to deal with Putin is various activities such as naming and shaming. Um, but in either one of these projections, right, both of these characters will come back to fight another day. Um, and I think the problem with this perspective is there isn't really a, a policy that originates out of that. Um, so I think. None of these portrayals help us come to grip with the changing realities of Russia and Russia's position in the global world order, its interests and its resources it has to pursue its interests, and also the changing reality of Europe, which is much more fragmented um, than where it was 10 years ago, and that has implications of how it's going to interact in the world. Well, what are Russia's aspirations? Um, another mistake that I think often gets made is there is a tendency to draw a bright line between the Yeltsin administration and the Putin administration. Right? Yeltsin wanted to rejoin Europe, right? he wanted to push Europe to the European house, right? and Putin is this guy who um, wants to just restore the good old days of the Soviet Union. And neither of those are exactly true. Um, the first thing to remember is that Russia has actually been trying to affect the outcome of elections since 1991. So this is not new. The only thing is that the elections that they were trying to affect the outcome were were in the former Soviet satellite states. Um, so then, presumably, the West didn't care, right? That was kind of Russia's, um, Russia's problem. I think that the second thing that we also have to think about is that Putin has actually evolved over time. So when he became president in 2000, he did not have the same rhetoric that he has today for presidencies and a president prime ministerial term later. Um, so when he started off in 2000, he actually wanted to join the European House. He talked about uh, Russia's shared history with Europe. Um, he focused on issues such as multilateralism, uh, rejoining the European House, uh, WTO accession, um, and in general, a more cooperative stance. Um, when President Medvedev served for his brief term, he focused on the modernization of foreign policy, right? Russia needed to rejoin Europe. I think you start to see a shift in Putin's rhetoric in about 2007, and that's when he gave a big speech in Munich um, in which he launched what I term his U2 phase, um, which is his new primary method of responding to the West was, well, you do it too. Um, but I think since 2007, we've seen really four key themes become much more prominent. One is the idea of, of disrespect that Russian interests are barely respected by the Western world. I think a second key theme is not a necessary desire to return to the days of the Soviet Union, but rather to return to the world of 1812, when Russia was a great power and it was taken seriously at the negotiating table, and that countries essentially had spheres of influence, um, and they agreed to stay out of each other's spheres of influence. I think a third key premise that is much more prominent is the rejection of Russia as a European country and the emphasis much more as Russia as a distinctly Eurasian country with different distinct cultural evolution and values, um, which it can use as a bridge right between East and West. And I think the fourth key theme that comes out is simply a different set of foreign policy priorities. And those are resisting Islamic radicalization, unwinding global economic integration and fighting the secularization of Western societies. 
And so I think while the perception of Putin is that he's trying to overturn the Western liberal world order, um, I actually don't think that's true, right? He needs it um, so that he can pursue his interests, right? He relies on everyone else playing by the rules, right? So that he can move in and out. Um, and so I think when we look at Russia, um, we see a definite phase two in terms of its foreign policy aspirations. And that phase two starts in 2014. And that's when efforts to intervene in elections jump the former Iron Curtain and move to Western Europe. And so until 2014, post-Soviet countries were targeted. Um, and then the second wave has really focused on Western democracies. And so you might think, why 2014? Um, part of it right, might have to do with being emboldened from the annexation of Crimea and the lack of concentrated response to that. Another might have to do with the sanctions that followed. It became much more important for Putin to then create um, leverage and cracks between the unity of EU countries so he can break the sanctions. Could also be emboldened that after having a much bigger splash than probably Russians expected with the US elections, um, intervention in the methods that Russia have, have used have been much cheaper than, say, former 20th century methods of military might. So what are the methods that Russia has used? It's used predominantly um, four methods um, in, I would say, kind of these 19 countries. Um, the one that it's used the least is it's sponsored coup attempts. The example of that was Montenegro um, attempting to overthrow the prime minister to block NATO membership. It has funded far-right parties in a number of these countries, most notably countries such as France, um, but also it's, uh, the pro-Kremlin party United Russia has signed agreements with parties in Italy, um, Hungary, and I think there's another one, but I can't recall it to mind. Um, I think a third strategy it's used is waging disinformation campaigns. That is the use of official Russian media, but also trolls fake Facebook accounts and fake news. Um, anybody who remembers the German elections, a prominent case was Russians um, planting a fake news story about the rape of a 13-year-old German girl called Lisa, right, which later turned out to be a fake. Um, I think a fourth way that they intervene is through cyber attacks and cyber espionage, leaking emails and documents to WikiLinks, um, in Norway and Germany, launching phishing attacks against parties and campaigns. And so Russia has been very active. But I think that the thing to think about is, does being active mean the same thing as being successful? And so then I think it depends on, um, you know, what do you mean by um, success? So if what you mean by success, has Russia actually changed an electoral outcome, right? I don't want to get into all the conspiracy theorists about trying to add, like, driplets of votes here and there for Hillary Clinton, would have made a difference. Um, Right? Leaving that sort of aside, I think more broadly, right? has Russia been successful in actually changing the outcome of the election? No. Some of the things that Russia has pushed for right, have come out in Russia's favor. So they're happy that Brexit passed, for example. They were happy with the results of the Czech elections. Um, parties that they have supported have done well. But is that due to Russian intervention um, that's harder to tease out, and probably not. And in fact, in many ways, Russian intervention has been a huge failure, right? It's pushed parties in the opposite direction. And so I think Russia's bigger impact has been acting as a bellows to fan the flames of pre-existing tensions that already exist. And so his primary success, I would say, or Russia's success, is to create enough fractures in the idea of unity with a relatively small set of resources. Um, and so for having a hand um, that doesn't have a lot of high value cards, Russia has played them well um, in terms of getting what it, what it wants. For relatively few resources, Russia can get a high profile rivalry that puts Russia in some ways on an equal footing um, with the West once again. But Nonetheless, um, it doesn't have the resources to sink in to doing much more um, than playing at the margins and exacerbating the cracks that already exist. So I think Russia's activities warrant serious concern, but I think the threat is exaggerated. I think European governments' jobs are to combat the divisions right, that Russia is exploiting. Right? So it goes back to the domestic level. And so I think the big challenge is designing 21st century tools 
to combat 21st century methods of political conflict, right? Now we still have a 20th century tool bag of sanctions and diplomatic expulsions, right? But as the world of conflict becomes and moves to non-state actors and other venues, we're gonna have to come up with other ways to respond. Okay, that's it. <laughs>